All right, problem 11, we have that from a random sample of 50 people, sitting pulse rates and standing pulse rates were measured for each person. And a coin was flipped to determine whether the sitting or the standing pulse rate would be measured first. So we're gonna let mu sub sitting represent the mean sitting pulse rate in the population and mu sub standing represent the mean standing pulse rate in the population. And mu sub d represent the mean of the differences between the sitting and standing pulse rates in the population where it's, we're gonna have sitting minus the standing pulse rate. And let's figure out which of the following represents an appropriate test and hypotheses to determine if there's a difference in mean pulse rates between sitting and standing in the population. Okay, so that was a lot of reading. Um, okay, so um, the two key things you wanna, you know, make sure you understand, you know, um, you wanna understand the differences between um, taking a two sample test and a two sample where you have a matched pair situation. So here we have a random sample of 50 people and the sitting and pulse rates were measured for each person. So each person had two measurements done. So each person acted as their own um, pair. And the reason for that is with the matched pairs, you wanna basically have um, sample data from individuals or two in the, in the unmatched pair of pairs to two people that are alike and obviously you know the, the, if you're the same person that's you know you, you, can't, you can't be any more alike um so this is going to be an example of matched pairs t-test again because um each person had two up two um recorded you know values that the sitting their sitting pulse rate and their standing pulse rate and then we're looking at their own, we're studying their individual differences. So we know, so it's gonna be at least D or E. Now, um, the both of these say that null hypothesis is that there is no difference in the mean pulse rates between sitting and standing. Okay, so, so they're both gonna have the same null hypothesis. The alternative though is saying um, whether it's is the mean, is the alternative gonna be that the mean difference is not equal to zero or that the mean difference is less than zero? So this is just, this is just gonna be not equal to zero because it doesn't specify if, if, we're at, if we're trying to determine if it's larger or if one pulse rate is smaller than the other. We're just saying, are they different? So when they're different, we just have to, we just have to basically think of it as not being equal. When are they not equal? That means they're different. The answer is going to be D. The problem 12. Um, we got athletes in a particular sport are classified as either offense or defense, and the distribution of weights for the athletes classified as offense is approximately normal, centered at 200 pounds, and ranges from 150 pounds to 250 pounds. The distribution of weights for the athletes classified as defense is approximately normal, centered at 300 pounds and ranges from 250 to 300 pounds, three, three, ranging from 250 pounds to 50 pounds. There are 1,000 athletes in each classification. Which of the following is the best description of the histogram of all the weight of the weights of all 2,000 athletes? Okay, so we want to basically look, figure out what the shape is when you combine all the um, all of these um, athletes, all, all 2,000 of them into one, you know, into, into one graph. So let's just draw them like, let's just draw like a sketch of what they would look like. So the, um, the offense goes from 150 to 250 and centered at 200. It's pretty straightforward. So 150, let's say it's over here, 200, 250. And we say approximately normal, so it's gonna be maybe something like this. Something like that, a bell shape, center at 200. 
Another one is going from, from um, 250 to 350, also about approximately normal and centered at 300. So 250 to 350. So these are two populations. So if you were just to make a histogram of these two, you're, they're, um, they're not really gonna interfere with each other's shape because um, they basically don't have, well, they don't, they're, they, they don't they have any of the same values actually. It's one go where one ends, the other one starts. One goes from 150 to 250, another goes from 250 to 350. It's gonna look basically like this. It's gonna look the same as if you put them on the same graph. And this is a bimodal distribution. It would be a bimodal distribution. Um, you, have, you have two peaks. It's non-normal because if it was normal, you would only have one peak. Not skewed. It's just simply bimodal. You can see that it's two, two symmetric peaks. Problem 13. We got which of the following pairs of sample size n and population proportion p would produce the greatest standard deviation for the sampling distribution of a sample proportion p hat? Okay, so there, you can, there's two, I would say there's two many ways to approach this. You can approach it very theoretical and mathematical, or you kind of just use some basic logic, which Maybe a little, maybe a little tedious, but maybe it's even much easier to um, understand. Let me just go through it that way. So remember, remember, you have a form of the sheet, and make sure you know like how your how your form of the sheet is organized. How, you know what um what equation represent what. So this equation is actually given to you. It's given to you right here. The standard deviation of the sample distribution of p hat. So. And so technically, you can kind of brute force this by plugging in, you know, the values in each group and testing to see which one would give you the biggest um, value here. Well, let's let's, pro, let, let's go through this a little more strategically, so it's not just a bunch of plugging and chugging. Um, we're taking the square root of something, okay? And let's first look at, you know, let's first recognize that. Um, um, with problem one and one and D are pretty identical, except for the fact that their populations are different sizes. In A, 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 A the populations are the, I'm sorry, the sample is a thousand, B, the sample is only a hundred. So if you think about this, you're taking the square root of something when will you have a larger value? Like, what are you gonna have a larger value when the denominator is 100 or when the denominator is 1000? And don't confuse this with, um, you know, the bigger value is gonna be better because you're actually, the denominator is gonna be a bigger number. So if you make the denominator a bigger number, the, taking the square root actually gets smaller. So you just think of it as, as a square root of one over, um, a hundred compared to the square root of one over a thousand. Let's ignore the P for now. Which of these would be the smaller one? I'm sorry, which of these would be the bigger one? The bigger value would be when you have the sample size of a hundred. But from there, you can eliminate that, you can eliminate that, eliminate A. And using that same, same um, logic, you can also see that C and E are you know basically basically the same are the same except for their sample sizes as well, but we can so, so you can also eliminate C because the bigger sample again is going to be a smaller standard deviation. Okay, so now let's look at the other three. So we're down to B, D, and E. So the other factor you want to look at is um. The, the numerator, what number is on top? 
Um, you're not going to, first off, I mean, you're not going to want um, P close to one. Because if you get P close to one, you're almost going to have, you're basically going to have almost zero there. You're going to be taking the square root of a smaller number over a bigger number. And again, you can plug and chug this, but this, yeah, and, and, and just check. But um, it's not going to be B either. You can, again, test that for any of those. And just, again, you can always test, you can plug in 0 0.1 or 0 0.01 for P. And just, um, I'm sorry, you can plug in 0 0.99 for P or something very close to one. And you're going to see that you almost you basically get a zero on top. So it's going to also eliminate that answer. And so with that same logic, you kind of just kind of work your way through on this. Just test the value. You know, um, so what for um for D and E, like if you have P is zero close to zero versus P close to point P close to, to one half, you only look you only care about the, the denominator because the sample size again are the same. You care about just plugging. Oops, by plugging um, plugging the values of p into the, into the top, so the square root of one minus p. So you can test you can test um, plugging you know, maybe point one, and then compare it to maybe point five, and you're gonna find that when you, when you have the um, the point one, you get a smaller number. Versus uh, if I plug if I plug in point one on top, point one times one minus point one is point one times point nine, point oh nine. If I put in point five into p, I'm gonna have point five times point five. So again, you can kind of work your way through that, and um, um, you know. Something they they this is not really heavily tested, but there is a more a mathematical way to approach it. It's, it actually really involves calculus or graphing. You know, applying the maximum of um of the of the shape of the graph, like the this would produce, like you get the x minus x squared. I actually go over this in my chapter six notes. If you want to take a look at that, but um, I wouldn't stress out about this type of problem. Um. But you're going to notice the one half kind of comes up a lot. Or not just a lot, but it's usually a theme. And it's a theme in the, in the probability section. But anyway, the answer will be easy. All right, 14. A 90% confidence interval for the slope of the regression line is determined to be negative 0.81 or negative, negative 0.181 to, point, to 1.529. Which of the following statements must be true? Okay, um, so let's just first remember, let's first just recognize um, what, um, what, what, what's going on here. This is just, uh, a, remember it's a confidence interval and we're doing a confidence interval for B or the slope. So our, we're estimating the, we're using the sample slope to estimate the population slope. And typically it's gonna be in this form B plus or minus T star times the standard error of B. But it's still just a confidence interval. This is still where the center of it is it's still gonna be your, you know, your the margin of error. Um let me try let me, let me pop up the formula sheet to see. These, the thing about this is, uh, is that um, the way that you represent these in, in your um, in the formula sheets is usually very different than textbook to textbook. But here's some the notation you would need to know and then I'll be comfortable with. And this is usually what they're going to have. It in. And I'll be and honestly, you really don't need really hardly ever need any. So you don't, I really rarely see this stuff on, your, on an AP exam, but here they are. There's, there's, these are really actually advanced. And so I'm really um, do these calculations actually would, it wouldn't be reasonable to do. So 
what you really want to get at is just to understand that we're S this is estimating slope. So just think of the center. Where, what's the center of the interval? The center of the interval, you just, remember, you just find the middle midpoints of those. You can add them and divide by two. Point, point eight one plus one point five two nine divided by two, and your your estimate, your point estimate will be point six seven four. So you were saying that the slope is you know you know going upward. We're saying there's a positive association or positive correlation with the sample data. And from that, we then can say, oh, well, the correlation coefficient of the data is then positive. Um, so D, so you can see they're trying, to, they're trying to mix you up because you, when you find those, the difference in them, that's the difference in the, um, in the endpoints, but you want to find the middle of that. So don't get that mixed up with D. But um, again, they're just really trying to see if you can recognize that when you have a positive slope, you have a positive correlation. When you have a negative slope, you're going to have a negative correlation. Um, and that's pretty much what I believe they're going to get at. Answers for sure today. Number 15, which of the following scatter plots is the correlation between x and y closest to zero? Okay, so. um. Remember, you kind of what we just went over, like correlation. If it's um, the more, um, the more, the more um, upward, the more of an upward trend it has, it's gonna be the more positive it can be. And um, R is so we say R is greater than zero. The more negative it, the more negative or downward it is, R is is um, less than zero. And remember, R can go from negative one. A positive one. It can never go over outside of values of definition. Now, when the R value is close to zero or zero, it's basically saying that the um, like trend lines or, or you know if you made a linear plot, you calculate the slope of the least square regression line, it would be horizontal. Now, that, now that's not always easy to see on a graph, which is why we like to run statistics. But so they're not going to be one that's tricky, or they, they, they shouldn't because they, they're aware of this. But they want to see if you can just recognize that, that you understand that a, that a slope of zero or a correlation of zero would basically be like there's no pattern, there's no up or down pattern. The, 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 um, the, scatter, the, the scatter plot is not making it clear whether there's a negative or positive association, whereas all the other ones are unclear. So here you can see that R is negative. Yeah, R is negative downward. Here it's negative still, you're still gonna say it's negative. These two, it's positive. But this one, see it goes down, then it trends up. So it's, so it's gonna be E. This one I'll show the closest correlation to being zero for x All right, so I hope that helps. Good luck.